started. But yeah, so welcome, like I said. So anyway, for to let you guys know, hey, if you don't know anything about me, don't know anything about what I do, you've probably been seeing me lurking around doing stuff throughout the convention and such. But uh, my name is Jake James Lugo. I'm a gaming journalist, gaming media personality, content creator, podcaster, writer, etc. I've been published in a bunch of different places, including IGN, including Playboy, including uh, Switch Force or Switch Player Magazine, uh, obviously YouTube, um, The Coalition, which is where I'm at now. I'm the senior editor over there. I've been on a bunch of other websites, done freelancing, doing a bunch of things. Okay? So I know a lot about writing and making content about games. And I always felt like, you know, a lot of people that go on YouTube or like write and do stuff, they don't always do panels or discussions like this, you know, to give people, you know, some, some wisdom, some knowledge, some food for thought about doing stuff like this. Because there's a lot of people that want to get into it and it's very highly competitive, but sometimes people don't want to share their knowledge. And I'm always like, you know what, let me talk to you guys about it and give you guys an inkling, you know, from my perspective about this type of stuff. So. Throughout any time, feel free to ask questions, you know, as I'm talking. Because, again, I know it's early. Everybody didn't have coffee. It's like blah. <laughs> so, and on top of that, it's an early panel, so I didn't even think there was going to be a lot of people here in the first place. I was hoping more would come, but, you know, early panels, nobody ever comes, especially after Saturday night. It's like, <laughs> it's like horrible. So. That is true. So, anyway, I do all this stuff, and even now I'm on YouTube. Again, if you guys want, definitely check out my YouTube channel. Even on your phones now, it's... Jake James Lugo on the search bar, but it's ga- youtube.com slash gamers with games channel. And I upload new reviews and other content every single week. Like I try to do consistently all the time. And that's one of the things I want to make a point about. You know, no matter what type of discipline or what type of thing you're into, you know, consistency, yeah, consistency <laughs> with making content is a really important aspect of it because, you know, not only you retain and build your audience, but you also really hone your craft. You really get good, get good, literally with your your skills you know whether it's on twitch whether it's writing whether it's publishing content whether it's making youtube videos etc it doesn't matter it's it's that creative like muscle is literally a muscle you just got to work it out constantly and use it and use it and use it and you get better over time one of my uh inspirations one of my role models and even i would even say a mentor in some cases anybody know who greg miller is from ig from ign formerly of ign he's a kind of funny you guys never seen that if you guys are ever into content creation or streaming and stuff, look him up on YouTube. Look up Kind of Funny because they make a lot of great content about gaming and other stuff too. But they started off coming from a bigger outlet going into the YouTube world and actually building up their brand and their company from there. Now they're like over a quarter million to half a million subs, you know, crazy rabid audience. They do stuff. But their consistency and their drive, you know, as a unit to do stuff really made them become a thing, you know, even though they had their background from IGN and stuff. So... Any questions, comments, concerns? No? No? Everybody's too tired. <laughs> Everybody's like, chill. <laughs> yeah, the seats are like, uh. But um, what else can I say? Like, you know, so truth about the games industry, games media and stuff, a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about it. You know, a lot of people always say about one thing or another about game journalists. Everybody goes on Twitter, obviously, I would assume, see stuff about gaming journalists or games media. A review comes out for a game and everybody's mad at the outlet. Everybody's mad at IGN. Like, oh, you gave Call of Duty another 9 or 10 out of 10. Well, you gave this game over here a 5 out of 10 or a 6 out of 10 or whatever. People while out. When my own review that I did for IGN for Naruto, I did it for Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm 4. And I gave it a 5.5 out of 10 because I felt like the game wasn't that great. But I also wrote the guide about it. I actually wrote the IGN guide for it. So I played the most that game than anybody else in the world at one point. And everybody hated me. The Naruto fans came at me in droves. They were vicious. These guys wanted blood. Like, I was talking about their beloved anime game, and they were upset, <laughs> like, really bad. You can't please everybody. Exactly. Like, but the thing is, is that everybody, you know, at least the common misconception is that people that do these reviews or make these con- these pieces of content are out to get their fans or out to get the communities. And, and that's not true. One of the biggest things that I see with IGN specifically is that they've had reviews like, you know, for example, the Pokemon games. Everybody remembers Pokemon Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. Too much water. Too much water. That was a meme. I know the person that, that made that review and that was became a meme. And she was trying to make a point about, you know, uh, the entire game is based around surf. You know, there's a lot of surfing around and a lot of water-based HMs and stuff like that. That's what she meant by that. But it became a meme to show like, oh, they're criticizing this game and saying that it's bad when it's actually good. I'm trying to discredit them. And that's like a thing that's passed around constantly for no reason. Like, they just constantly say stuff like that and really demonize the outlet. And it's not just IGN, it's Kotaku. Everybody knows Kotaku, right? Mm. Everybody's like, oh my god, Kotaku is doing all these clickbait articles and stuff. It's like pretty insane. But like, the, the big misconception is that these people are out to get these communities or these games, and it's not true. These outlets and stuff, they're made of multiple people, many people. Sometimes people that have nothing to do with those reviews that everybody's mad about get thrown in the same boat. 
And I always thought that's not cool. One of the biggest problems I also saw is that this type of stereotype gets perpetuated by a lot of content creators. And I think that's wrong. As a content creator myself, I think that you have to do due diligence to your audience, whether you're a streamer, YouTuber, et cetera, podcast or whatever. You have to be able to be, you know, not not, not just relevant, but also, you know, not, not what's the word I'm looking for? Courteous. So like, damn, I can't remember the word. It's basically like do good for your audience, you know, so that way they could trust you. You could be trustworthy. Credible. That's the word I was looking for. Credible. You want to be credible towards your audience, you know, of what you're saying. You might not always agree with them or you, they might not always agree with you or other people out there. But at least what you're saying has some sort of relevancy and it brings a point to what you're saying. Whatever you're doing, whatever content that you're making. And that's something that's always stuck with me over the years. I've been now, I'm going on 10 years in January that I've been doing this, you know, or a little bit more, give or take, like that. Because, you know. I was on YouTube in 2010, 2011, give or like around there, and then now up to this point. So I've been doing this for a while, so it's like, you know, a lot of crazy stuff that you see. One of the other interesting things too, you know, again, if you're someone that's like making any sort of content online and such, is that, uh, you know, a lot of people, you, there's always this intimidation factor that whatever you're gonna put out there is gonna be scrutinized and criticized. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, no matter what type of content you're doing, and it's not always true because there's always an audience for somebody to do something. There's always a, a grouping of people that might like what you like, you know, or like might like what you're doing and stuff. But a lot of people don't really jump into it. They always get intimidated by like what, you know, the response might be. Always these might be's, you know, the what ifs mm -hmm. and such, rather than just making like Nike and just doing it, you know, just literally just diving into it. That's, that's what Greg Miller always says, like, just get up and start doing it and you'll do it now, like, and just constantly do it and you'll get better over time. So any questions, comments, no? Still tired? Because <laughs> I want to know how to frame this discussion for you guys. So I want to know from you guys what you want to know about being in the industry or doing stuff like this. Um, Talk to me. So, so mm -hmm. I watch uh, plenty of YouTubers, mm -hmm. and uh, I was wondering, what's your opinion on uh, mm -hmm. YouTubers who are most, uh, mostly, or sorry, reviewers who are mostly known for uh, giving angry, caustic... Uh, like Angry Joe, there, or et cetera. Yeah, I love Angry Joe. Yeah, I, mean, so I met him. He's dope. He's cool Most dude. of the time, I like his stuff, and mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, what's your opinion on those things? Here's the thing. Sometimes the personality and the gimmick could overshadow the individual. Like, Angry Joe's not always angry all the time. Oh, like, you know, yeah. it's fun. And he over-exaggerates it, because people, you know, they watch the videos for that, and it trends for people. And sometimes the fans, the viewership, the audience, kind of disassociates that with the individual. They think that that's them all the time, 24-7. That's not true. Mm -hmm. But I've met Angry Joe a couple of times at various events, like E3 and PAX and stuff. You know, just saying hello and passing and stuff. And he's not like, he's really cool. He's really chill. Mm -hmm. You know, but he makes a lot of content for a lot of different people. It's like a million plus, or a couple million plus people yeah. like that. The thing that I always said about whether it's reviews, whether it's content that is constantly negative, I don't think it really adds to the greater conversation about games. I don't. I think there's a time and place to be negative, to be critical, to be scrutinizing, but you don't want to do that as a constant thing. Like you don't want to be the drama alert of mm -hmm. like you know the gaming industry. John, everybody knows what drama alert is, right? You know, some, some, drama alert is a is like a TMZ of the YouTube world that's like always looking for drama and stuff to put in people's faces. It's like. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be like that. The, the way I looked at myself, and you know, sometimes I compare myself to other YouTubers, even some people that have come here, is that I always wanted to make the content that I wanted that would actually give something to the audience. That they could walk away, whether they agree or disagree, whether they liked it or dislike it, they walk away with something. Because I think that's how you build up the industry, that's how you build up your community, and that's how you also make your content everlasting. And sometimes the angry you know, crowd, the angry YouTubers, the angry creators, that persona, you know, will work for some people. But for me individually, it doesn't work for me like that. Not all the time. Again, you could be negative. You could be critical. You could be angry and rant about something. But it doesn't always have to be a 24-7 thing. Yeah. But that's just me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of like, people who watch that kind of content. Mm -hmm. And like, they fall for that reason. And they kind of they act that way. Mm -hmm. like, they, get they think that's acceptable. Yeah, again, you as a YouTuber or creator, and you're putting yourself out there, sometimes you're like, you know, a role model for some of these people. And you're doing stuff, again, whether it's gaming or otherwise, you know, you're in front of people, especially when you get on camera and such. Like, you, you have a responsibility towards your audience to put something good out there and also something positive. I don't think you always need to be negative. I don't think you always need to be a jerk. To be, I, that's why I was talking about the stereotype before with larger websites. A lot of those YouTubers, they're always taking jabs at the larger websites, and I never thought that was cool because... I've seen channels that, like, when IGN has something that everybody, like, dislikes and stuff, they're making, like, five videos throughout the week, you know, updates. You know, if this happened now, this person said this on Twitter, these people are going after this person. It's like, like, you know, gets those hits and gets the views and it's quick views, but it doesn't add anything to the discussion about games. Mm -hmm. Like, controversy, perfect example. The contra You guys remember the thing about the IGN plagiarism thing? Did you guys hear about this? Okay, it was earlier, like, last year. Yeah. Okay, so to sum it up, TLDR. 
basically, you know, there was a guy named Philip Musa that got hired as the Nintendo editor at IGN, and he plagiarized a lot of people's work, you know, from their videos to make his own video content. It was a big deal. He got fired immediately. <laughs> I know some of the editors there that when that was dealing with stuff, and I felt bad for them because it's like, yo, that's not their fault. Some dude was being a jerk and plagiarized all these. There was a lot of people. Let me put it this way: he was so bad at doing this, he plagiarized. Jason Shire from Kotaku was like, wow, he plagiarized this stuff. He probably did more. So the guy's like, yeah, go find it, Jason Shire. I dare, I dare you to find more. Jason Shire went and found more because everybody else found it for him <laughs> and exposed him. Like, wow. you want to talk about an L, a big L, the, the biggest L I've seen somebody take in this industry because he did something. He played himself. You get the, all the memes and stuff. But um, basically, that, that person messed it up for a lot of people that work at IGN that didn't have anything to do with this. He was plagiarizing his own coworkers. And they're getting blamed by the audience for this stuff. It's like, oh, IGN is plagiarizing this YouTuber and all this. I was like, yo, there's like hundreds of people at IGN that didn't do stuff like that. Like, you know, you can't be like that. And sometimes YouTubers that are doing that type of content, you know, they're constantly perpetuating that. And the audience doesn't know any better sometimes because they're going to follow whoever their favorite YouTuber or creator is. So I think it's the responsibility of the creator, especially larger ones, to take a little bit much more proactive action and be a little bit more assertive and more uh, mature, I think is the right word, about that stuff. As opposed to just trying to get by and trying to get yours, you know. Because when you want to make good content, you want to be something relevant in this industry. I don't think just being bigger is really the entire picture. Because I only have, in my YouTube channel, again, subscribe to my YouTube channel when you guys get a chance. <laughs> shameless plug. But I only have like under 1,600 subs. Like I'm trying to get better. I want to get larger and stuff. But at the same time, I'm not trying to be that guy that wants to be a, a, a quick five-minute wonder. A quick minute wonder or whatever. You know, I want it to be relevant. I want my stuff to be good and stuff. And I feel like we need more of that in the industry. Not both the content creator side, the professional side, journalist side, the, the whole thing, the whole nine. So well, there's there's the guy I follow on, on YouTube who started doing this, I guess, in 2010. Mm -hmm. And he he just did it as a hobby, and now he's 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 huge. Yeah, now he's and, larger. And he's huge, and and every time I watch his videos, I walk away with. You know, okay, you know what, maybe, maybe I should go back and look at this game or something. Mm -hmm. Which is good. Which is what you want. You know, you, as an exactly. audience member, you want to feel that. You want, as a creator, you want to be able to do that because obviously that builds your audience, attention and stuff, but also puts out good stuff into the industry, good stuff, good karma into the world. You know, I don't, I don't want to be John, I don't want to be Keemstar, I don't want to be Angry Joe, I don't want to be, you know, a lot of the other crazy gaming channels, drama channels, Alpha, Megas, whatever. You know, you guys probably know more about those stuff, but the point is that I want my stuff to mean something. And the only way it's going to mean something is if I make sure that it does mean something. Right. Some exactly. social posts are pretty mm -hmm. positive and where there's a lot more negative than positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is why I will admit, I was intimidated by Twitch. I've always wanted to be on there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the fangs. <laughs> the fangs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. And I was like, okay, so, uh, one of my friends who streams quite a bit got me into Twitch streaming. Mm -hmm. So I Especially on Overwatch. <laughs> yeah, well, Overwatch could get vicious. It's hard yeah, to get <laughs> that's, why, that's why I always go, Man. I must not do this. Mm -hmm. If someone starts commenting on my channel while I'm streaming, I'm like, mm, don't say that. That's, that's not right. That's rude. Mm -hmm. So it's always, I try to be positive. Mm. Even though it's hard, <laughs> hard to do much. So yeah. Just try to be positive because there's so much negative. Of mm -hmm. course, there's a lot of there negative. Is. There's, there's a lot of negative. Just, just try to be positive. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, subscribe. thank you, thank you. Uh, shameless plugs all day here over here. Need all the shameless plugs. But, but uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. See, nice. It's working. I'll, I'll have to do it when I get it's one. working. Tell everybody. Here's the thing, too, okay? Because one of the things I find, again, since we're talking about the truth about the industry, what I find is that a lot of creators and a lot of even media personalities don't always give back to their audience stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I see a lot of people now using Patreon, and I have a Patreon, too, which is cool, you know, because you need to make money, you know, with your content. But sometimes I feel like they make their audience pay for like smaller stuff when they really shouldn't. Like yeah. five dollars or ten dollars to join your Discord. Like, come on, no. son. Or early access to your videos. I get the early access, the five dollar whatever. But like, I try at least even with my own Discord, I try to keep things low because I want people to access the content. Now, part of that, uh, understandably, so is because I'm a smaller creator. If I'm a large creator, obviously I would think a little bit yeah. differently. Yeah. But I'm always of the mindset like, give the audience more and they'll appreciate it more. They'll appreciate you more. 
you know, for me, like I have, I don't, I have a Discord server where people just join freely, don't have to pay anything, just do that and have like places where people could talk about stuff, gaming, anime, movies, mm -hmm. artists. I tried to do a whole thing in my Discord for artists. I want them to share their work, so maybe one day I can make like a video and showcase all their work mm -hmm. for people that want that exposure, that want that stuff to, you know, get out there, maybe get thoughts about stuff, or even do something where I could just give away something cool, you know, to an, a lucky artist who just made something dope. Like here, here's a free game. You know, do something like that. Yeah, cool. You know, because I feel like that's cool stuff that would give back to the community. It's more interesting stuff that's not like, you know, it's not always trying to get something from your audience. Your audience feels like they're getting something out of you. Mm -hmm. Like that. And it's just it's just weird to me that a lot of creators don't always do that. They're always trying to be the next larger star to feel like they can get the brand deals, they can get the money from Patreon and all these other crazy things and just keep going to get theirs, not be realizing and seeing the full picture. But again, that's just me, from my perspective. And it's like when you're starting out, you can't really do much. Mm -hmm. so you have to Mm -hmm. No one's on there. Yeah. <laughs> Join right mines. There. It's free. Join it. <laughs> exactly. Like I have it on there, and I have my <laughs> bot that goes off once in a while. It's like, hey, join. But <laughs> let let me ask you guys. Like, what other stuff do you guys want to know about the industry? Just so I could get an idea. Um, Anything at all? It could be good, bad, whatever else. Again, because there's a lot. Again, I've been doing this for a while. What's up? What's the easiest way to break into it? The easiest way to break in is just to make content. You know, like I said, just constantly, all the time, you know, put it out there and make stuff consistently. You know, that's the easiest way to get your foot in the door or talk and go to events, talk to people, because there's other things that you could do. Mm -hmm. A lot of people always say, go to events, talk to these people, like harass them and stuff. It's like, no, don't harass them. <laughs> don't be that person, just like harassing mofos. But like, actually go and be proactive in some of the stuff. You know, go to an event, you know, show yourself, be like, hey, I have this backlog of YouTube videos and dope stuff that you would love to check out. Or go see some of your favorite creators, be like, hey, what's up, I do stuff too. You know, a lot of people get caught up in the idea of like, you know, the, the celebrity of it. Like, you know, meeting your favorite creators, like, oh my God, fanboy, fangirl, and stuff. That's cool, but like, these are also people too who are also in the same position that you were in. And probably the same position I was in, I'm in now, in some ways, you know. So they're people too, so it's nothing wrong with actually putting your stuff out there, going to talk to them, and actually, you know, marketing yourself a little bit. A lot of this is marketing, a lot of this is branding, mm -hmm. such. But like actually doing it and actually having something to show and bring to the table. You know, eventually the audience will see it and people will see it. That's one of my biggest struggles now personally for me is that I have a lot of dope content. Again, when you guys watch, you'll see. I have a lot of dope content, but not many people are really seeing it. I don't have a spotlight on me, so I'm not blowing up as much as I might want to. So I have to constantly keep putting stuff out there. So hopefully it clicks in some way so people can see it and stuff. So that's the best way, at least in my personal opinion, to break in any industry. But specifically with content creation and gaming. Like that, that's how that's how I've done it so far with everything. Any other thoughts before I continue with my thoughts? Any mm -hmm. um, I guess something I've been curious about for a while now mm -hmm. is that um, considering Nintendo is basically uh, headquartered in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, how uh, how easy is it to approach them compared you mean like to companies? Say, Sony and Microsoft? You mean just like, companies in general? Yeah, like com yeah, compared to other companies. Yeah. So believe it or not, there's a headquarters here in the United States in Seattle. That's for Nintendo. It's Nintendo of America. Oh, okay. they're, they have their, pub, their PR called Golin, which is like their firm that they do a lot of Nintendo PR stuff. Here's the thing about games. A lot of people think that getting into this stuff is getting a lot of free games and free stuff, which there is an element to it, but it's not the whole story. It's not, And it's not something you gain so easily or overnight. You know, I had a guy, I have some horror stories I can tell you about people <laughs> coming up to me and be like, yo, you got, got, you got contacts for such and such developer or publisher for games and stuff? I want to know. And then when I tell them no, they get mad at me. It's like, I have, oh my God, I had a whole dude, right? That hit me up on Instagram asking about Turtle Beach headsets. Because I do a lot of headset reviews of Turtle Beach, so I have a lot of Turtle Beach headsets. I got like over 20 of them, which is cool. It's awesome. It's dope. Hearing that at first glance, it's awesome. Not realizing the other part of that story is that I built that relationship with that company for years. So they could look at my stuff and trust me and be like, oh, this is someone whose opinion can matter about our product. Because we're giving them like $200 plus dollar headsets. This is expensive stuff. We should make him go buy it instead. But they trust me enough to actually warrant my opinion and to share with their audience and share it on social media. He didn't understand that. And I tried to explain it. I was like, no, I'm not going to give you a random contact for somebody that I know. Because it's like giving your friend's number to somebody you know that you don't know. It's like, you don't do that like that. Especially when you don't know the person who's asking you. And they got upset, wrote me a whole essay on my Instagram DM about this. I was like, and they got mad at me talking about, oh, you're not humble. You know, you're really uptight and, you know, pompous. I'm like, excuse me, sir. Like, you need to understand. Like, you just don't do that. You, you don't come, you need to come correct to someone to ask them about that. But also you need to 
show what you're doing. You don't want to just give somebody, you know, because a lot of Instagram models, I guess you call or Instagram people think like that because they want to be a social media influencer. That's like, that's the new hotness right now. You got an Instagram, you got like, what, 50K? So now you can start getting free stuff. Like, no, it don't work that way, baby. Yeah, I wish I had that many. <laughs> but to get back, yeah, right? I wish I had that many. I know. Be amazing. But here's the point also about to get back to your question. You know, companies, again, they vary of all shapes and sizes. You know, different games developers and publishers. Indie developers are the easiest to work with because they're much smaller and they want that exposure. Bigger companies, obviously, is a little bit more complicated because they have a brand to protect. They have people that they have to deal with. They get requests from everybody constantly. Even with as long as I've been doing this, there's sometimes, you know, when I'll go to request the game and stuff and I won't get it, you know, for one reason or another. Because popular game, only so many codes to give away, you know, product to give away, things like that. And it's not the full picture, you know, because you're doing this to make the content. You appreciate the games, you appreciate the free stuff, but you're doing it to make the content to actually put your voice out there and be relevant in the conversation about whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So perfect example, Nintendo is always notorious to work with because they're very difficult because it's Nintendo and they could do that. <laughs> Literally, they've been around, they've been around almost 100 years. Being, like they're, they, they were in the 1800s. That's like how stubborn they are. So I don't always, I used to be a Nintendo brand ambassador and then I stopped being it because they changed up their stuff and dropped a whole bunch of people from their brand ambassadorship. I used to get games from Nintendo to write about for like the DS or the 3DS and the, the Wii U. And the thing is about it is that that's not always a guaranteed thing. So even if you're doing this for a very long time, you can still get told no and you have to just deal with it. Because when in reality, they're allowing you to check out their games. Otherwise, you have to go buy it and do it yourself, which is what most people do when they can't do that. You know, it's understandable, you know, but... Money's tight, you know, you can't always do that, so it helps out. Don't get me wrong, because, you know, all 20 headsets, so that's a lot of money for headsets, a ridiculous amount of tech. Mm -hmm. But, you know, someone like me, and I'm pretty sure others out there are grateful to have that type of access, but some people get caught up on the access and the, and the, the, the reward from it, as opposed to the process of getting to that point, which is very important, you know. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> so any other thoughts, comments, questions? So nothing, nothing. Okay, so... Well, there are horror stories I could tell you about the industry. It's like <laughs> crazy. I could tell you some fun stories. Okay, so everybody knows about E3, right? Mm -hmm. right? Okay, so my first E3 that I went to years ago. Okay, I've been to five E3s professionally as an industry person that got approved to go. It's different than paying for the pass to go there. It's much more different. To me, it's a much more kind of like proud thing to say that you earned this like that. My first E3 I went to in L.A., was when, you know, all the big three were there, you know, everybody's showing their games and stuff. That was the first time I met a lot of personalities that I've watched on TV, like Jeff. Anybody know who Jeff Keighley is? Game Awards? You know, Spike TV? You know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, you know that? Uh, what is it? Uh, Adam Sussler. Anybody know G4? Uh, X -Play. I used to watch him all the time. Adam Sussler is one of my biggest role models. I finally met him for the first time there. You That's know, awesome. Morgan Webb. Uh, what is it? Marcus Beer, the annoyed gamer. Um, trying to think of other people. Oh, Cliffy B. I met Cliffy B for the first time. You know, a lot of these people, and it's cool. I don't say that to, to brag, but I say it's like there was a reverence to this mm -hmm. when I was there. It's like, yo, I'm around. I was watching these people on TV, on G4, and now I'm next to them as a colleague. That spoke volumes to me, and that really inspired me to keep going with this. That's when my first C3, when I went there, everything clicked for me, and I wanted to be a part of this for the rest of my life. Even though it's a lot harder now, there's a lot of struggles and stuff, but it's still something I'm proud of. So something I, I feel like, you know, it's important to me. And a lot of other people don't really realize that. You know, for a lot of people, it's like that for many people who are in the industry. You know, one of the coolest moments that I had from that E3, I went to a after party for Bethesda. This was before Fallout 4, way before Fallout 4. I think it was like after New Vegas or something. Or I can't remember. There was like a bunch of Bethesda stuff that was going on, but they had this place there, right? And they were still running high. Yeah. So Bethesda, yeah, they were, this was before 76. <laughs> Fallout 76. But, um... I went there and it was a after party. A lot of media go to a lot of after parties, which we'll touch on in a second. But they go to these after parties and everybody's drinking, you know, open bar, having food and enjoying themselves. And my best moment was when I got to meet Adam Susser and Marcus Beer in person for the first time. We were talking, we took a selfie, we were just having a ball. It's like, I'm thinking to myself, like, damn, I watched this guy for years on X Play, like, thinking, like, damn, I want to be out there and stuff. And now I'm hanging with him. Mm -hmm. You know, and he actually gives a damn because he sees me as another colleague that's been working on this stuff. And then added more to it that next day or the day before or the next day, went to the Ubisoft press conference and he was there too. We were walking by. He's like, hey, how you doing? You know, just little things like that that just spoke volumes to me knowing that I was a part of this stuff. And like that, those are the cool moments you hardly ever hear about, you know, in the Twitter, you know, space or the social media space because everybody's like, oh, this person gave this game this review. This person was being a jerk on Twitter. This person said this and that. It's like, that's the stuff that gets, you know, overshadows everything else rather than those cool, fun moments for people that are in the industry. You know, because the audience just didn't really see that and such. So, comments, concerns, 
questions. Do you want to keep asking so I can keep you talking? <laughs> yes, I'll take some candy. That's awesome. It's granny candy. It's granny candy. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. Let me go. I've been, I've been See, trying to get for you two, right? For three days. Nice. I'll take like the other two ones. There. Thank you. <laughs> but um, uh, what other stuff can I say? Oh, I've been speaking of uh after parties. A lot of people, a lot of people say like different things about you know events. You know, after party stuff, you know, when it comes to E3, PAX, everybody knows what PAX is, right? Yeah. Penny Arcade Expo, et cetera. Place for a lot of events, after events and stuff. But uh, the thing that people don't really realize is that when you go to these events and stuff like that, you're still also technically working, you're networking and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it's not always drinking wild and partying in the club and stuff. It's not like that all the time. Some people, people, especially in in the higher echelon of people in the games, they don't always go to them. They stay home. They'll go, they'll work, and then they'll just go back to the hotel room and do other stuff and just chill. You know, not all the time. I had my face when I was at E3 or PAX where I went to every party. I wanted to go experience this. I wanted to be there with everybody. So I've had fun adventures where I met, like, you know, voice actors like Troy Baker. Everybody knows who Troy Baker oh, yeah. is? I met Troy Baker for the first time at a party randomly. Like, he didn't know who I was. He saw me drinking. He was like, hey, what's up? I'm like, hey, how you doing? Like, and a conversation happened from there. I heard a lot of that's the kind of stuff happens a lot in Dragon Con where all the creators. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. different things like that happen, you know, over time. You know, and even then, you know, speaking of creators, you know, at, at uh, PAX and stuff, I'll meet a lot of YouTubers that I watch and stuff. Or YouTubers that I watch and sometimes I'll change my impressions of them. You know, it's that personable thing. But, you know, you're constantly networking. You're constantly experiencing stuff like that. But people think it's like everybody's bawling at the club. And it's not always like that at all is my point that I was trying to say. Um, what other things can I tell you guys about it? Uh, just trying to think. You know, damn, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to see where you guys want to talk about because, again, you talk so much. But um, another thing I guess I could say, you know, when it comes to making content, like a lot of people get into the video stuff. I, I come from more of a traditional writing background. That's how I got into video and everything else because I write my reviews and write my editorials a lot. And I wrote guides for IGN, so there's a lot of writing that's involved. Some people have that same type of drive and other stuff, you know, getting into it with video or podcasting. Because I podcast every week. So if you guys want a good gaming podcast, I post it up on my Twitter all the time. Like every Monday, I have a gaming podcast called uh, Buddha. I do it with a friend of mine where we talk about all the gaming news. Stuff for, like, for people that commute, you know, to like, you know, do their own stuff, like going to work. You know, something to do like that. But I have a lot of that stuff. And the reason why I talk the way I do about this stuff is because it comes from my writing. Because I like to really get deep into the conversation about games and the idea about the industry and things like that. Because I always felt like it, it, it makes you a better creator and all this other stuff if you know how to write. Because you think differently a little bit. You know, when you put out your thoughts to pen and paper or you're typing and stuff, you start to formulate sentences and ideas and concepts and try to get deep into it. It's different than someone just winging it on camera. Mm-hmm. It's very different. You could re- easily tell the difference between people that make scripts when they do stuff and people that don't, that just do random stuff. Apparent immediately. So, you know, it's stuff like that I always felt like was very important to me. That's, again, when I started off, my first website was called Real Taco Gamer. A website that didn't really do much, and I was doing constant, constant, yeah, content constantly, you know, putting it out, like writing, doing videos, interviewing people, coming to Florida cons. I used to go to a lot of Florida cons down in South Florida to do, like, coverage and interviews with people randomly. Not even just celebrities and the guests, they're just people that were just there to hone my craft and stuff, and people started to see what I was doing and stuff. Even coming to LumiCon and ShadowCon beforehand, I used to do the same thing. My first ShadowCon, I went with my dad, and I was doing the same thing, just covering the convention, getting pictures, photographing the cosplayers, you know, showing the video from all the events, talking to some of the guests, you know, as best I could. So it was a, a constant thing. So, But, again, it all goes back to my writing and the way that I approached it, the way that I kept the conversation going about it and such. So that's another tip. Like, if you want to really up your game as far as, like, the way you talk and discuss things like that, learn how to write. Take the time to sit down and write stuff. You know, whether it's about gaming, it's about movies or anime, whatever. It could be anything. It's just the skills that could be translated to all that stuff like that. Any thoughts, comments? I'm going to keep asking. What's up? Uh, just kind of about, like, photography. Mm-hmm. So, I'm not, like, I'm not good with it. I'm not very graphic. Mm-hmm. Why not? Uh, here's the thing. In college and a few other places, I took 35 millimeter in digital photography. You know, just to, you know, have the skill. Because when I go to cons or I go to events like, you know, E3, PAX, whatever, I like taking pictures of things that are there. Even what's called, like, you know, just people in motion, just like, you know, the backgrounds, people just doing their thing, you know, in life or in media's res, I guess you call it. I forgot what it's called. But basically, people that are just doing their stuff, I'll walk through, like, the dealer's room and you'll see me taking pictures or taking video. 
like just some people just blooming around because I show like how big the cons can be and like how many people are there like what's bustling about it you know stuff like that or the costumes the cosplay and stuff you know showing out the full outfit the full body and stuff like that things of that nature and I feel like you know taking those photography lessons helped a little bit but it's just like another thing you know you get to see things a little bit differently and talk about things a little bit differently because you do that so yeah I say go for it why not like, just do it just do it make like Nike and just do it son. I'm a photographer Nice. And, Disney. and every once in a while they'll let us kind of experiment with settings. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that I learned more from experimenting with settings and doing different things with the flash and playing with it. I mean, mm -hmm. literally just going out there and playing with it. Mm -hmm. And and that's the best way to learn. You can watch a hundred YouTube videos on how to photograph with a flash. Mm -hmm. But you really don't know what you're doing until you actually break the settings. I mean, like, mess up the settings so badly on the camera <laughs> that you have to go in and oh fix everything so that everything looks good again. Mm -hmm. It's like driving into an unknown area and getting lost mm -hmm. so that you can find your way out. It's funny you mentioned that, right? It's funny you mentioned yeah. that because that also, that same thing could be also translated to taking screenshots in games. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, again, as someone that wrote guides for, for IGN, we used to take screenshots of certain stuff to put into the guides. Because we need pictures, obviously, so people can see what you're doing. When you think about stuff, it's not just showing just whatever it is. You know, it's got to be relevant to the image, the words that you're putting there. Like, you know, if you're trying to teach people how to do a certain thing to get past a certain section, they have to be able to see what you're talking about. They get the helpful guide. Otherwise, if it's just words, nobody's going to read that thing. They'll be like, okay, whatever. They, I just don't feel like reading all this. Unless they're, like, really deep into it. But, like, coming up with screenshots, here's a perfect example. I did the Easter egg video, okay? Mm -hmm. Combination of all the Easter eggs for Fallout 4, for the guide for Fallout 4 on IGN. And I mm -hmm. went there and I got all the Easter eggs that were like movie references, I actually showed them. Then you, when you're thinking like that, again, you're thinking like a photographer, you want to be able to show things clearly and show it from different angles and whatever else, you know, so people could understand immediately what they're looking at and stuff. And I did that for the entire video of all these different stuff. Like, there was like Jaws references, there was like, you know, sci-fi movie references, all these other crazy stuff. But it's like things to think about like that. But it, that same type of stuff could be translated to that. Again, all these types of skills bleed out to each other. So, any other thoughts? Do you guys want to hear any other crazy stories, fun yeah. stories about the industry? Anything specific? Because I want to see um, what you guys want to know about. Maybe. This is the true game industry exposed. <laughs> um, More at 11. I'll, uh, <laughs> well, so I'm here too, so. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh. No, we got mm -hmm. plans. Oh, sweet. I got gold. Good? Thank you. No problems. Thank you for coming. Um. Mm -hmm. I guess, uh, do you have any stories about where a company was clearly messed up and was trying to do damage control? Oh, okay. I got some fun Ooh, stuff. I got some good ones. I got one where a company did not like what I said about a game and tried to get the review taken down and somebody else would to review it. Oh, nice. So, I forgot the name of the game, but it was a remaster re-release, HD re-release of an old game on PS4. Mm -hmm. And the game, when I was reviewing it, crashed a lot. When a game crashes on console, it goes back to your dashboard and stuff, and it doesn't, again, it's not good. It's, you got to tell people about that. It's like, oh, it happened five times. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it's like, how did this get past beta or whatever else, you know? So I put it out there. It was actually a guy that apparently worked at IGN for a while that was there for, like, Bull Guard way, way back then. And he was so upset with what I was saying about the game because I gave it, I think it was like a 20 or a 30 out of 100 because mm -hmm. it was really, because yeah, the game crashes, like, Crash you can't, can't play a game. You're not going to pay $60 for a game you think's going to crash after like 10 minutes. Get out of here. Like, So I said that, and he didn't like it so much. He actually wrote both to me and to the editor-in-chief saying like, hey, I feel like this review is wrong. It's disrespectful. It's not giving it a chance. I feel like some things are a little bit inaccurate. You know, can you please take this down? Or we would appreciate it if you, you re we would appreciate it if you would take it down and then have another person re-review the game. So I looked at that. I'm like, oh, excuse me, sir. That is hilarious. That is not happening. Mm -hmm. So what we did in response to we didn't respond to him because we thought it was stupid. We actually did a short podcast about it, talking about it. <laughs> Put it out there. And we tagged him. It was like, hey, guys, just let you know. We're not doing this. Like, yes, here's the problem. Like, sir, I understand PR. You know, again, I have a couple friends of PR that do stuff. And you have to be protective of your IP. And it's not like they're trying to do damage control all the time. They want people, like, they want things to be fair. Because I've had games where I've said critical things about it, you know, that I've gone for free, and, like, you know, the PR understands, like, okay, I'm trying to do due diligence to my audience and be fair about it. Like, I've, okay, I had games that I've had great relationships with PR for, like, Bandai Namco, and, like, I, I love Bandai Namco because they're so cool with, you know, getting games out and doing different stuff and being variety, 
but sometimes I'll hate some of the games that they put out, like the Seven Deadly Sins anime game. If you guys remember this, there was a game for the Seven Deadly Sins. I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's not that great. I said it. Mm-hmm. I said it was bad, and they understood. I gave it, I think, like a fifty or sixty out of a hundred, but it was not that great. It was kind of mediocre. Mm-hmm. And I said that, and they appreciate. Like, okay, we appreciate the honesty because they look at all my other reviews and they say, like, okay, I'm not like one way or the other. Even though they would appreciate every game they get a hundred because mm-hmm. it helps them out. You know, people buying their games. But they understand that my opinion is supposed to be, you know, to judge a game fairly, you know, just to be honest about it. And they appreciate the honesty. But there are some other companies that sometimes don't do that. You know, something you'll get ones like that that would be like, oh, if you don't give us 100, we won't work with you ever again. And that's bad. That's stupid. You don't want to ever see something like that. But it happens every once in a while. You know, what's up? Have you ever had a, a company go back and fix things? Like when you, like oh, you fix have, after I reviewed after it? Reviewed oh, yeah, all the time. It. The thing is, I'm not going to review it again. Like, right. there, there are times where a game gets updated, and that's different. There's a difference between getting an update and a patch and right. getting a re-release. You know, perfect example, right? Catherine. Okay, Catherine just got full body now. So Catherine full body technically is not the same game as it was before because there's so much more extra content with it. But then you'll get, like, a, a re-release of a game like Final Fantasy VIII Remastered. And even though that's an older game, I still reviewed it like a new release like that. Mm-hmm. But then there'll be, like, Monster Hunter Iceborne, which is a new uh, DLC for it, you know, from Monster Hunter World. Because I reviewed Monster Hunter World. I'm not going to do another review of Monster Hunter Ice World Iceborne, even though some outlets do that. And that's fine because they play towards whatever algorithm and stuff that they're going to do. But I give it an impressions. I wrote up an impressions about what was going on and my opinions about it because I'm still giving my thoughts about it without having to do another review of that sort. But sometimes games and companies will do different things that they'll go back and actually talk about stuff, you know, or they'll do, they'll update stuff again, you know. But again, it's to my discretion as like the, the reviewer or the creator or whatever else and stuff. So any other thoughts, comments about the industry that y'all want to know? <laughs> stuff. Hey. But you guys want to hear more horror stories or more crazy sure, stories? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of. Mm, okay, so let's see if I can think of a good one. Okay, I can think of a good one that a guy was like super. Okay, this guy was super rude to me. Okay, so it's actually a content creator from a while back. He actually has a Guinness World Record. So, so I go around a couple years ago, and I'm trying to talk to other creators, YouTubers, and podcasts <laughs> and stuff to be on my talk show podcast that I do on my YouTube channel because I like. Talking with people, I call it definitive discussion, where it's like we deep dive into a topic where they're an expert about that we could have a definitive discussion about that topic for the audience. That's the whole gimmick and premise behind it. So one of the ones I wanted to do was about building communities. I wanted to have a discussion about, okay, generating an audience, getting people together, getting people to be a community in the eyes of like, you know, online and stuff, you know, different things like that. So I went to a guy named EMP Triforce. Triforce is one of the guys that apparently not only ran Empire Arcadia, the fighting game competition thing, but he also was one of the people that has Guinness Book of World Records, you know, for, like, old NES games and all the classic games and stuff. He walks around with a power glove, whatever, okay? And that's cool. That's dope. Here's the problem, though, okay? So I go to him. We connect on Discord. I'm like, hey, you know, I would love to talk with you, chat with you, and do all this different stuff. However, he, instead of, like, saying, hey, I don't have the time to do it. I can't do it right now. It's, you know, maybe some other time, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You know, cordial and stuff. Well, this guy comes out and goes, and he gives me a whole song and dance about how, you know, it's a waste of time. Basically, the sum of that, it's a waste of time what I'm doing because I don't have a large audience. It's a waste of time to him. I said, excuse me, sir. Like, and then he went on to go on and say that, like, you know, I have to have time. You know, my time, you know, needs to be put out there to someone that could be reached out to audience. Because if you're not reaching out to audience, you're not doing anything special or relevant. And so I'm like, listen, son. Okay, I told him. I've talked to people that have much larger audiences than you that don't treat people like that because that's rude. That's mm-hmm. wrong. Because as someone that wanted to, that has communities, that part of a, the fighting game community or whatever else, you should understand that every voice out there that has something to say should matter, or at least be given the fairness, the diligence of it. Everybody has stuff to do. Everybody has time that's expendable, or not expendable, I should say. That you know they got to do their own stuff. But you shouldn't dismiss someone that rudely when they've not done anything rude to you, which is not cool. Because again, like Greg Miller... One of the guys that I think is awesome, he has like millions plus like following on like social media. He'll go up to him, like give you a dab and a hug. And it's like, hey, what's going on? Because he appreciates every person that goes up to him and asks him stuff. Even working with other smaller creators to do stuff every once in a while. You know, there's people like that. There's people like, uh, what is it, uh, James Chen. And so again, since we're talking about the fighting game community, one of the most best uh, fighting game commentators out there came on my show just because he loves talking about fighting games because he likes doing that stuff. So that type of attitude I always thought was rude. But he, after I told him that, he literally listed all his accomplishments on Discord about what he does, all his records, all the money he's made, all the stuff that he's done. And he's oh, trying wow. to tell me, he said, 
the, and I quote, I'm not even joking about this. He goes, welcome to the real world. <laughs> I'm like, son, you don't know what the real world is because in the real world, people don't act like that. The, I go, this is why you're the villain in the King of Chinatown documentary. That's all. He, he, was a, he was in the documentary where it was like he was the villain because he was doing like shady stuff, like suspect stuff. And I was like, that's why you portray like that. But like it, it's stuff like that that you hear about every once in a while or you see every once in a while, which is pretty bad. Like there's, there's another horror story. My friend Hip Hop Gamer, his name's Gerard, right? There's a thing where people don't like his personality because he's so eccentric. He's so up in your face. He's like a almost a stereotypical like you know hip hop guy. He's like hype all the time. He's like, yo, son, this game is fire, son. It's like constantly, okay. But because again, him being African American and stuff, and sometimes there's those pocket races every once in a while that are in the industry. They'll come out and actually be rude because of his eccentric personality, but also try to confuse other black people with him and actually deny them access to stuff which is really messed up, but no matter how you slice it and stuff. And I've seen it and I've heard stories about it. There was a friend of mine that was an Overwatch commentator that was actually, you know, he does his own thing. He's very professional, very nice on camera and stuff. And he got denied working for a, a group and stuff because they thought he was hip-hop gamer. And it was like, just because he was black. And I said, wow, that is pretty fucked up. That is wrong. You know, there's, there's horror stuff that you see Every once in a while in the industry, you know, you just got to deal with it as it comes. You know, you don't go looking for it. Every, you, you would look online and people would be like, oh, my God, this is everyday thing. So, but it's not always the case. But, again, when it does happen, it happens. Another big one we want to talk about. What's up? Okay. So, back to, uh, like, mm -hmm. DM, I don't know, the first guy you said who, like, goes through all these complicated Oh, yeah, Triforce. Triforce, okay. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm curious. Do you think he, well, what he said and how, or how he said it was disrespectful, mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's some merit in his words of when you are a huge content creator, you're trying to get bigger, you're trying to, you know, blow yourself up, whatever. Mm -hmm. You try to work with those who are in, I guess, your yeah. level per se, and um, in your range, mm -hmm. in your range to mm -hmm. a degree, mm -hmm. you know. And I think how he said it was disrespectful, but if he's trying to like raise himself up or like if your reach isn't very big, mm -hmm. you know, like he has let's say I don't know 17 million. I'm throwing a number out there. He's mm -hmm. 17 million. You have, let's say, 20,000 people, mm -hmm. uh, but your audience doesn't reach a lot, and that's just not value. He doesn't see the value in that. But that's not what he was saying, though. He was saying that literally, like, any person that's, like, beneath him is a waste of his time. He wasn't trying to say it where it's like, okay, I want to do stuff that's actually going to give something to the fans or give something to my audience that will keep my brand and relevance, you know, good. He's actually looking down upon people, not just me, but, like, other people, okay. like, right. being conceited. There's a difference because I've had it where I've talked to other creators that are larger than me or larger personalities and games journalists that have much bigger platforms than me, and they don't treat people like that when they tell them no. When they tell them no, they'll either be like, they either one won't respond, which is mm. yeah, like he has, let's say, I don't know, 17 million. I'm throwing a number out there. He's mm. 17 million. You have, let's say, 20,000 people, mm. uh, but your audience doesn't reach a lot, and that's just not value. He doesn't see the value in that. But that's not what he was saying, though. He was saying that literally, like, any person that's, like, beneath him is a waste of his time. He wasn't trying to say it where it's like, okay, I want to do stuff that's actually going to give something to the fans or give something to my audience that will keep my brand and relevance, you know, good. He's actually looking down upon people, not just me, but, like, other people, okay. like, being conceited. There's a difference, because I've had it where I've talked to other creators that are larger than me or larger personalities and games journalists that have much bigger platforms than me, and they don't treat people like that when they tell them no. When they tell them no, they'll either be like, they either one won't respond, which is fine, or they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do it right now, you know, maybe some other time I'm busy. You know, that there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with getting told no or receiving a no. Yeah. When it becomes a problem, though, is when it's like, it becomes rude. I've had it one time, and again, even in the industry, one time I was trying to, I think I told you even about it, where I wanted to do something about, you know, the IDGA, the Women in Gaming stuff, because I was doing all this content and such. And then one of the pres, I wanted to invite the president of the IDGA to come talk about what they do and stuff. And unfortunately, instead of saying no and doing stuff like that, they, they tried to insinuate other stuff, which just didn't make sense. So they, they tried to insinuate based on some of our previous content that we were pocket sexist, which is not cool. Because you would think, like, yo, if you, if you want to come talk about your stuff, you'll come and tell us about what you do because it helps your cause or whatever else. But they didn't see it like that. They were being very conceited and very condescending. That's, that's the word I was looking for, very condescending. Like that. And that's wrong. For no matter where you are mm -hmm. in the industry, whether you're small, large, medium, or large, whatever, you should never do that because obviously it's a smaller industry. Everybody knows each other to some extent. But also, it just, again, it, it allows you to open up more doors to work with people and stuff. It's just not something I don't think, I don't think personally is really cool like that for me. Any other comments, concerns, stuff? What's up? Have you noticed, um, see, what you were talking about kind of reminds me mm -hmm. of the experiences that women 
have been dealing with with the whole Gamergate situation. That was, believe it or not, that, that was, was not just about women in gaming. The Gamergate was a, such a complicated, messed up issue. Like, was, I'll talk about it though, but continue. Yeah, uh, and mm -hmm. you know, and it, you're right. It wasn't just women. It was also. It was a whole bunch of other stuff. It was stuff. a whole bunch. It was <laughs> a, a small group of white men going where minorities help. That I don't uh, even think it was about that. That's the, that's another thing. Here's the thing. Let me because uh, again, I'll get back to your point. Yes. The whole thing about Gamergate, about white men specifically, I feel like that's become a fad to, to attack that group as a reason to look for a villain. It's right. not just white men that are being racist or misogynist or whatever else, because there's like that of all people out there. Mm -hmm. The problem is, though, is that when it goes on social media, the messaging gets so convoluted and messed up, it becomes something that it isn't. Because, yeah, obviously, I mean, gaming is a porn thing. Obviously, minorities and other voices in gaming and any sort of industry is an important thing. The problem is, is when you try to weaponize that and when you try to actually attack everybody else that doesn't agree with you. Perfect example. Everybody knows who Nina Sarkeesian is, right? Everybody knows who that is? From this frequency, when the game is, all that stuff. There's nothing wrong with that cause. But, like, you don't have to be constantly going at people about stuff. I, I got into a whole discussion about it one time, or a debate even, about that, where it was like, oh, no, if you're against what she's doing, you're wrong, you're not part of this stuff. It's like, no, that's not the case. Because real feminists aren't out here trying to attack men. Yeah. I mean, if that, she, she calls herself a feminist. And that, I feel that that word's been demonized a lot yes, it has but been, yeah. it's it's more that like listen the cause and the goal is noble and that's good for any industry especially in gaming where we're predominantly mostly men but that doesn't mean like all these men are going to try to keep women out or try to push women out there are people that are like that that are being jerks and I, I think that they're more of a minority than people give it credit for especially when it comes to people listening and having a platform but the thing is is that you want to be able to have the people out there that are talking about that stuff but also contribute it and present it in a way that people are going to take it in like for example, Life is Strange. I gave away Life is Strange the other day on, on one of my panels. Some people consider that game to be an SJW game, and I hate that term. I think it's so stupid because it's been, one of those things is like to discredit something just because it's trying to tell a story or make a certain point or get to a certain demographic. It's just like, one, play the game, first off. Two, you know, just because it's not for you, don't discredit it for other people or don't try to like dump on it, you know, on both sides of the equation. Like that but yeah so it's a very complicated and again gamergate was never really about just women again a lot of people in the media made it seem like that yeah, it was more about it was more about the the drama and the bs between a couple different people that got right. turned into a hashtag and then there was a crappy situation all around and then people turned it into something against larger outlets about games journalists about games media which yeah. wasn't about it. it was stupid and it was i remember even being in in the midst of that i went to new york comic-con one year and i got to talk to some of the people at ign about this and they decided not to report on it and the reason being is because listen we're about games. This isn't really about games. This isn't about anything related to the gaming industry other than drama. We want to, as much as people want us to talk about it, no, we're going to stick to our guns and talk about the games and keep doing what we do best. And I always admired that because every other outlet, like Kotaku, Polygon, everybody else, yeah. fed into that because it was what was relevant at the time, but not about what was relevant for the industry or what's relevant to the industry, exactly. even though those topics are important. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, any other thoughts, comments, concerns? No? <laughs> Good discussion. We've got 10 minutes, so i got time for more stories, horror stories. Horror. More horror stories? stories? Said, oh, okay. Horror. You guys want to hear the Kojima story? Oh, the sure. The Kojima, Hideo Kojima, okay? So, okay, i got a story about Hideo Kojima. Don't tell me he's sexist. Don't tell me he's sexist. No. Hideo Kojima is awesome. Let me tell you this. This is the most stylish man. One of the most stylish men that's Japanese game developed that I've seen. My first E3. I go to this thing, and I, I went with the coalition, and I had a bunch of people there, and we had a guy named, uh, was it uh, Carl? I think it was Carl, or, or uh, yeah, some, I forgot his name. One of our people that was over there. So we're running around. This is the same year that Metal Gear Solid Five was getting promoted out there. So you had the Diamond Dog shirts everywhere else. Kojima comes out with this jacket, that leather jacket that's, like, fit to him, that's got Diamond Dogs on the back on the side. He looks fresh, okay, mm -hmm. super fresh. So... One of our friends, okay, that was working with us, goes it's like, hey, listen, I'm going to go to the bathroom, you know, before we go to our appointments and stuff. So goes in there, maybe about five, ten minutes, give or take, maybe, you know, however long it took for him to do whatever. And he comes out looking pale as a ghost. I mean, like, this guy was, like, pale as a freaking ghost, like, white like this, okay? <laughs> but comes out, we're looking at him, I was like, yo, what's wrong? Are you okay? Is everything all right? He goes, like, guys, you don't understand what just happened. I was like, well, what happened? He's like, guys, you will not believe me what just happened. Like right now, I'm like, what is the problem? Like, what are you good? I'm trying to find out if he's good. Those guys, I just took a piss next to a day of Kojima. <laughs> I'm like, excuse me, sir. I'm like, what? He goes, you guys don't understand. I literally just sat in the year, stand, stood in the year and took a piss next to a day of Kojima. My day is complete. I was like, <laughs> so we started clowning on him all day. So it was like, oh, so when you were standing next to him, did he show you his solid snake? Did he show you his big boss? Was he your big boss right there? 
all day. <laughs> Clearly. It's, like, it's stupid moments like that that just make it fun because it's like, you know, you don't expect to run into something like that. I have another Kojima story. The, this past E3, okay, uh, there was the, no, no, not past E3, the last E3. There was a statue for Death Stranding for Norman Reedus, you know, the big maquette statue and stuff that was promoting near the PlayStation section. And uh, J.O. Kojima was being sneaky, like going around because he made Metal Gear Solid. He's going to be real sneaky like that with his little uh, camera and stuff. Staying in line, standing in line with all the people waiting in line to take a picture with this thing. Now, mind you, this is his game <laughs> right there. Yeah. So the people there, he's not someone that you would easily look over. He's recognizable because he's right. famous. Okay. Yeah. So we're standing in line, and I recognize him, and a bunch of other people recognize him. It's like, oh, shit, it's Hideo Kojima. What's he waiting in line with everybody else there for? He was doing it waiting in line because the people in the front that were running the line were, like, ordering people around and stuff. He wanted to see what they would do, apparently. And he wanted to go take a picture of the actual Maria statue. So as soon as he gets to the front of the line, the person there doesn't realize it's him and starts ordering him around and stuff. And so finally, you see that moment on the person's face when they realize, oh, my God, that's him. He made this? But it was, like, a total 180 change on them. And he was just, like, goofing on them the entire time. So yeah. much fun to see stuff like that. Like, oh my god! Like, then there was a story, right? Well, this this one's not Kojima, but there was an after party I went to where I saw a bunch of games journalists for like different outlets and stuff, all dancing because they were all drunk. It was like a rave, like whatever thing. And I saw them like doing the worm. It was like the weirdest thing. So I was like, listen, I watch your stuff and I read your stuff, but he's doing the worm, oh drunk, god. on this stuff. It's really funny. Like, there's stupid stories like that that are constantly happening all the time. So, mm. question, comments, concerns. Thoughts, other stuff you want to know about, anything? <laughs> the P was good. The P was good. Any other types of like stories and things you guys want to know about the games industry, games media, content creation, etc. Any anything at all? I'm trying to think. I'm trying to go with the next like six seven minutes. Yeah, left. Trying to do. I have a lot of stories, but I want to know what everybody wants to hear about. Horror stories. Oh my god. Um. There was one time, again, going down to, to E3 where I got left in the middle of, like, uh, downtown L.A., you know, because I was constantly, like, checking out a whole bunch of stuff, and I ran into Troy Baker. Troy Baker, the voice actor for, like, you know, Uncharted, The Last of Us, etc. So that was pretty fun. And then I met the guy from iZombie the same night, like, randomly. Like, he was just there drinking and smoking a hookah outside this club, just randomly, just there. He's like, oh, hey. So he starts talking to me. He's like, oh, okay, hey, how, how you doing? I know you. I watch you. It's like, stuff is stupid. It was pretty funny. A few years ago, some friends of mine went out to um, a, mm -hmm. a gaming convention out in Las Vegas mm -hmm. and ended up meeting Greg Ellis on the nice. elevator. And they're huge colonites, huge, you know, I, mm -hmm. I was actually supposed to be with them, but I couldn't get the money together. Oh, he just reminded me of something after the story. Okay. They ended up going to the bar, and he was buying them all drinks, and they just had a blast. There was like... Ten of my friends hanging around him at this bar, and he's telling stories and entertaining them, and taking selfies. Like he's grabbing people's <laughs> taking selfies, and just having a blast. And and speaking of which, yo, there's a funny one. Okay, so you guys know who Shuhei Yoshida is from PlayStation? No. Okay, no. Shuhei Yoshida was one of the president people over at PlayStation. He's the, he's the guy for PlayStation Japan. He yeah. walks around. He's a little small Japanese guy with glasses. He does okay. stuff. Okay, he does a lot of stuff, and. At PSX one year that I went, it was my second PSX that I went to, uh, PlayStation, everybody just goes from the event and they go to like a local hotel bar where everybody's either staying or they're doing stuff. So everybody moves from the convention center to this whole hotel bar next door. So it's everybody, everybody's there. It's like games media people, YouTubers, uh, content creator, uh, you know, other content creators, you know, PlayStation people, you know, developers, third party developers, just there. So I go there and I see all the PlayStation execs, like Shuhei Shida, uh, was it, um, uh, damn, I forgot the other guy's name that was doing with the PlayStation 4. Not Jack Trent, but the, another guy that's like light skinned. He, he's one of the president people. He's on the stage during the PlayStation conference, you know, the keynote and stuff. They're all there getting drunk. And I mean, <laughs> shit face drunk. One guy was loud as hell. Like he had been talking. He's like real kind of quiet on the, on the presentation, the keynote. Now in this bar, he's talking mad shit. He's like, goofing on everybody, talking about stuff. He's, like, making jokes about the competition, about Nintendo and Xbox. It was, like, really hilarious. And then you have Shuei Yoshida, who's sitting there, like, in the corner with everybody going around him, talking and stuff. He's red, like a tomato and stuff, and he looks like a bobblehead. So he's not even paying attention to what people are telling him. He's, like, a bobblehead like this with his drink. Like, the entire night, just talking to people, just agreeing with it. He doesn't know anything that they're saying. Like that is, and like Greg Miller will come up to him and start goofing at him, talking about him. He's like, "Hey, Shuhei, you want to come on our PlayStation podcast?" And he's like, "Yeah." 
Like, yeah, like the entire night. Just like, I swear to God, it was the goofiest, funniest thing I've ever seen. But like, there'll be moments like that. And then there'll be other moments like, you guys know who the What's Good Games girls are, right? What's Good Games are and Brittany Bromacher and stuff. Brittany is one of the loudest ones. She's loud. She starts screaming because they had like a meetup there. There's a bunch of, uh, was it, people there just to see when she starts screaming, who wants drinks? Who's going here? They start giving away PlayStation games, stuff, but they're loud. Like, literally, the entire hotel is like hearing this woman scream about the most like random stuff. It's like all the people are just like, again, circling around. It was so much fun seeing like goofy, stupid moments like that because it makes the entire experience so much better. The, those are the cool moments for the games industry that hardly anybody gets to hear about because everybody's like so caught up in other stuff. But it's so much fun and oh, crazy. Okay. But yeah, where are we at? We've got two minutes before this ends. Like, any other final comments, stuff you guys want to know about before it's a wrap? Well, thank you for coming to my panel. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Check out my YouTube, shameless plug time. Check out my, check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash gaming of games channel or Jake James Lugo. Follow me on Twitter because I'm constantly posting up constantly on Twitter, twitter.com slash Jake James Lugo. Instagram, Instagram.com slash Gamers with Gains. And then I'm also on Twitch, Twitch.com, Twitch.com slash Gamers with Gains. So you guys can check out all my stuff.